Okay, let's start, guys. Hello? Yo. Guys, hi. That was uh, the midterm. Not mine, I mean uh, Sam's midterm. Hurts? <laughs> it's okay, you'll get used to it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, what did I want to say? So, uh, I realized that actually uh, there's something messed up with uh, the way the classes are scheduled because right now there's probably students with ACSD that are still taking the 266 exam, right? So now they're missing a lecture and then just realized that kind of uh, random information. The other thing that I realized that's messed up is the uh, midterm, uh, mid-course evaluations that you guys took last time. Uh, technically, they're given during the mid-course so that I can fix the end of the course, but apparently they have to retype them, all of them, score them, and then send them back to me. So uh, I'm going to have to wait for this, probably going to come like next month <laughs> at the end of the course, you know. <laughs> I should have looked at them uh, before submitting them, but apparently I'm not allowed or some stuff like that. So we'll see. For the midterm, my midterm, see some people freaking out. Others are saying it's very easy, chill, guys. One step at a time, okay? Uh, I'm going to correct it probably during this week and then uh, give you the grades. I'm also going to compare it to my quizzes to make sure that the exam is not too far from the quizzes. Obviously, I have to keep a certain performance in terms of like distribution for students. If it's too easy, you're not going to get your grades because I'll probably be fired for making it too easy, right? Okay? And then you'll have re-evaluation or I know what system they have in place. If it's too hard, it's the same thing. Okay, same concept. So there's a certain distribution that the students need to follow, which is uh, important to keep in mind. This way, the level that is projected by the university stays the same, okay, or improve. If I give you all 100%, <laughs> they're going to be like, okay, this is not like high school. Like these guys need to, you know, um, have a certain level. So that's for that. There were two questions about metaphase, anaphase. Some students didn't like that. Uh, I think I was unclear. Uh, about what I meant in terms of don't study for those. Because um, if you read the book, first I'm going to tell you I'm going to either remove them or give everyone a point for that, okay? But I'm, ha I'm going to have to be more careful with the wording I use because if you read the book, you'll, you'll see that it goes into so much details in terms of the different phases of prophase, etc., right? Spindle fiber forming, all that stuff. This is what I meant by you don't need to know all these details, but you still to need, need to know how the chromosomes align because mitosis doesn't have crossovers, meiosis does, and it's because of a different alignment, okay? You also need to know when they are pulled together after that alignment, but it's okay. I will remove it or I will give you all a point for that. Question number 24, that's the second one that came up. That's the interference question, okay? I think it seemed like a trick question, but I think the students were too stressed and did not read it properly. Answer A does not say close to no interference. It says no interference. Answer B says close to. So if you got 0 0.15, it's close to 0 0.4. It's not no interference or close to no interference. You understand what I mean? So read the answers. I'll be careful with these questions because my goal is not to trick you. It's just for me, it seemed clear. Like you read the first one, no interference. Well, I equals zero, that's basically A, not close to I equals zero, right? And I think the students just saw the close everywhere and they were like, okay, it's close to no interference also, okay? So what I'm going to do for that question, I'm going to read all the exams. And uh, if you put 0 0.15 in it, um, let's say, for example, you wrote your notes while you were calculating, I'll give you a point. But I'm not going to do that for the final exam. Please read the answers properly, okay? Because no matter how I put them, you're probably going to still get mixed up from the stress, okay? So that was not the goal, but I'm going to fix it, okay? Uh, what else? So for the exams, I'm not going to review it now. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to first correct it, make sure of the class distribution and all that, and then maybe you can come to see your exam if you want at my office, okay? We'll do it this way. And uh, please don't be like me when I was a student. You do the midterm, you never go see your exam, <laughs> okay? Go see your exam, okay? It's important for you. Uh, what else? Do you have any questions for me? Um, what else? There was uh, another concern about uh, um, the, well, 
not many students, but uh, there was a concern about the level of questions. Students seem to be picking up on words I say, and that's it, instead of picking up, <laughs> you know? So I'll, I'll, I'll clarify this too. I said once that some questions of the exam are easier than the quizzes, and it is true, because if you see that question that asks you about the 10 genes, and two of them are like, hetero five of them are heterozygous, and the other are homozygous, that's an easy calculation to do, right? Much easier than the quiz, in my opinion. One times one times one times one times two times two gives you 32, you understand? So this is what I meant by easier than the quiz, okay? But in any case, in any case, I will look at the quizzes, I will look at the exams, I will compare, I'll make sure that you guys are within distribution and be fair to you, okay? Make sense? Cool? <laughs> okay. So now the less boring stuff about uh, course admin. <laughs> Uh, so today what I'm going to do is just, so uh, did I do, did I send the wrong one? Let me just see if I saw, uh, no, it's good, okay. So first of all, this here is 11, because number 10 was the guest lecture. Um, everyone came to the midterm, except one person. Um, so keep doing that, should be good. <laughs> Uh, if uh, you are not sure about the room, because I found one student like looking for the room. <laughs> if you are not sure about the room for ACSD, please make sure beforehand. Luckily, I was walking towards one of the room and I found the student in the, you know, in the couloir, whatever you call it. Uh, and so imagine I didn't find him and then he sends me an email saying I couldn't find my room. Well, I don't know that. And me, for me, you skipped, you know. So make sure you find the room, okay? <laughs> uh, anyways, okay, so today we're gonna do lecture 11, which is just a remainder of chapter six. Uh, we're not gonna cover, uh, uh, what do you call it, transposons, so write that. There's no question on the exam about transposons, I'm saying it, <laughs> okay? Um, instead, what we're gonna do is just transformation, transduction, and then I'll let you go, because I know it's uh, reading week soon, okay? Uh, what else? Next week no no class the week after the schedule is, is going to change a little bit because i took the exam like i made the exam before i had to cut chapter six into two and not squeeze chapter seven in one lecture okay so what we're going to do is probably be missing like one lecture at the end of the semester but we'll start freshly from lecture uh, from chapter seven so two lectures per chapter every week okay this means that your next quiz will be on transduction and transformation, still chapter six, okay? So when you go to the quiz, chapter six. Sounds good? Good, questions for me? Answers, no, <laughs> something. <laughs> okay, so uh, I guess I'll uh, get started. First, how did you find my exam? You know, now that the students are here. Yeah? Was good, not bad? As expected, okay. Easier than uh, Samantha's? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, uh, we'll see, we'll see. Uh, she's probably, I don't know how she's gonna do her class, but uh, we have to follow, again, these performance standards. So if uh, sh it's too hard and the students are not doing well, she'll fix it, okay? Hopefully, I don't know. Don't take my words for this, okay? <laughs> um, okay, so let's get started. So we saw three lectures ago, or three uh, seances ago, let's say, um, horizontal gene transfer, and we look specifically at conjugation. Let me just get my laser pointer. So this part here, where you can have either a plasmid or the HFR strain, um, putting DNA into another cell, and then recombination happening here, uh, double crossover, while here it's a single crossover, and then this can integrate the DNA. Today we're gonna look at two other modes, transformation, which is the uptake of DNA from the media by bacteria directly, or transduction, which is basically acting like, it's a virus acting like a needle and putting just DNA inside the cell, okay? But before we do that, a little review. This was on the uh, exam, no? Similar to this. <laughs> okay, so um, if you remember when we crossed an HFR strain with another strain, um, and the time of entry of genes can determine the gene order, right? And so I gave you an example like this where you had number of colonies um, and then the time at which 
these colonies started to appear, right? And the way you read this, this table is very simple. You look at the 10 minutes, the first one that is there, that's the first gene. You look at the second line, second gene. Third line, nothing, still the same. Fourth line, third gene, okay? Does that make sense? So the first one is LAC, second one is TRPA, and then the third one is histidine. Make sense? And then, and then from here, you can count the distance between the genes, right? Because of the time at which they start appearing. Obviously, it's not 100% mathematic, like, but it's a good uh, indication, okay? So let's just skip this. This looks like this. The other mode, so now we start the new two new modes. So the other mode that you can uh, have where DNA is integrated into the bacterium is through transformation. Transformation in bacteria happens through the cell membrane, uh, where you have these pores that actually can uh, take up DNA and put it inside the cell. For E. coli, so naturally speaking, this does not happen all the time because the DNA and the uh, cell membrane don't like each other, okay, just because of chargers and things like this. But it does happen. Um, usually when we want to put DNA into, into bacteria, and we use them a lot in the lab, it's, to, it's by using two things, either heat shock, so you heat up the, the cells, and when you heat them up, their membrane becomes kind of fluid, right? And allows for these holes, these micropores to open for the DNA to enter. The other way of doing this is through electroporation. So when you, um, when you shock the cells with a certain voltage, uh, they will open up these pores on the membrane and then be able to take up DNA, right? We use this a lot in the lab because it allows you, so bacteria divide super fast. So if you put DNA in it, let's say a plasmid of interest from, I don't know, mammalian cells, because bacteria are prokaryotic, right? You can still use their machinery to multiply that plasmid to the point where you have micrograms of it that you can then purify and use in your downstream experimentation. And the way we select for it when we do transformation, literally, I put the cells inside a water bath that's 42 degrees Celsius for one minute, and then I add the DNA, the DNA inside that tube, and it will take it by itself, okay? And then whenever the cell you leave it for overnight and then you can select because your plasmid that you inserted kind of has an antibiotic resistance gene in it so for example uh, usually for bacteria we use ampicillin most of the time it's the cheapest and easiest to find so the plasmid has my gene of interest and it also has the antibiotic resistance gene so when i plate it i add ampicillin and suddenly only the cells that have the plasmid grow which i can then take out put into a big flask, let it rotate for a few hours, and then you have this much bacteria that you can extract from the DNA of interest. Make sense? This DNA sometimes, most of the time, does not integrate the, the bacterial chromosome, but sometimes it does. Yeah, it's just uh, similar with everything, pretty much. Now, in terms of inheritance, because this is what we're interested in, in really, uh, when you take up DNA from the media, from your surrounding, two genes are only co-transformed if they are very close to each other. Because this here does not form for a long time and uh, will not stay open, the cell will die, okay? So what happens is that if they're very close to each other, they'll go together. If they are far, they will be independently um, transferred to the bacteria. So this is the same kind of as the independent assortment and linked genes, and then the, usually what we do for this to calculate the probability of two genes going together is just the probability of one times the other, right? Something very simple that you saw. And so let's look at an example that could be on the exam, uh, next one, <laughs> uh, which is related to how genes are inherited in terms of transformation experiments. So let's say we have a strain that has uh, resistance genes to four drugs, A, B, C, D. This one has only three, but imagine four, okay? And it's used to, tra uh, it's used for a transformation recipient that contain, that is sensitive to all four of them. So that means if you put any of the drugs, it will die, right? So you break those cells and then they will take up the new DNA and that will integrate the, uh, recipient bacterium, uh, chromosome. And then, you count the colonies. So you grow them in different combinations of these drugs. 
For example, you grow them without any drug. So they all grow, you see 10,000 colonies. Grow them with only drug A, B, C, D, and then A, B, A, C, A, D, etc. all the combinations. And you look at the number of colonies that are generated from these. If you take a look at this, can you figure out which gene is co-transformed with the other the least, the most rarely? Anybody? If they are far, they don't go together, right? And if they don't go together, A or B? A, B. So, uh, well, I was asking for one gene. So you look at the one that has the combinations with the others, uh, right? Because I'm asking you which genes are, yeah, B, exactly. So if you look at B with A, so if you have those two genes that went inside the bacterium, the recipient bacterium, then that bacterium will become resistant to drug A and B. But there's only 46 colonies. That means it's very rare that they become uh, resistant to those two drugs together. So that means those two genes are far from each other, right? If you look at B with other genes, BC, same thing, BD, same thing, right? So this means that B is the furthest from the other genes. All right, now if I ask you to map this, if I ask you to map this, it's quite simple, doesn't look like it, but you look at combinations of two genes. And the ones that form the most number of colonies are the ones that are closest to each other because they were inherited together. So if we take a look at the combinations, you can see that AD has 942 colonies. That means that AD is, is uh, inherited, so this combination is inherited together much more often than AC, AB, etc. So then if you start drawing the map, you would have the resistance gene 2A next to D, very simple. And then you have to find C, right? Um, B and C. So let's look at C. If we look at AC here, um, so if we, if we look at other combinations, you can see that CD has the most number of colonies. So that means CD are closer together. So then C would be somewhere here. Does that make sense? Okay, very simple. So then you just put C here, etc., and you continue doing this. Right? Um, <clears throat> seems very uh, complex, but not that much. My favorite part, viruses. So this is one of the best courses they have in this department, okay? 472, uh, virology, and then you can do a lot with this in the future, like become a clinician, uh, even though you're not in medicine, in terms of uh, viral infections and giving, let's say, diagnosis to different infections, okay? So this is something that you can do, but you need a postdoc in it, so in like 10 years, uh, and you have to follow, to do a huge exam, which is kind of the admission exam, okay? But you can become a virologist without going through med school. You can also become a clinical biochemist. So when you go, let's say, for example, do your tests at the hospital, while there's someone that's kind of looking under the microscope, making sure that you have this infection or that, et cetera, so that's called a clinical biochemist or microbiologist, depending on what you're doing. And those act as doctors in the, well, they are doctors, but in the sense that uh, they, when, so let's say, for example, you have cancer, there's a group of nine, 10 people that work together and you are part of that table to make sure that that patient uh, goes well. And you also decide, for example, treatment for certain infections because you do your postdoc in that. And so you're acting kind of like a specialist for that. So there's virologists which take care of the viruses side of the hospital, and you can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Exact. Yeah. And then if you look at A and C, there's much less colonies, so it shows that it's further than the two. Cool. So I was thinking of doing this. The, that's why I'm telling you about it. But I'm tired of uh, doing postdoc after postdoc. <laughs> so I'm going to just leave it here. You know, I'll try to uh, become a full-time professor in the department. But I thought about it. And it's uh, very competitive. I think they take like five people or something like this. So. But you can try. So viruses are pretty interesting because they come in multiple shapes and forms. And they have different types of cells that they can infect. 
and different mechanisms. Some of them are much more harmful to the human than others. Some of them are, in, are uh, infectious through just breathing, others through body fluids, etc. Okay, And depending on the level, for example, H HIV, Ebola is through, uh, through body fluids, bacteriophage is for just bacteria, so these are all for human cells. Influenza, you can imagine that it goes through air, droplets, and also uh, through contact, etc. Most of them we have a vaccine against it. Some of them we're still trying to figure out uh, because their, their way of infecting the cells is kind of complex. For example, HIV um, is, in, is a virus that can basically integrate your own DNA. And when it integrates your own DNA, it's quite hard to fight it because it's inside your cells, right? So what we do for HIV is give these antiviral drugs which decrease the load of virus into your blood so that you can you know, live a normal life. So we do have that. And there was a big scandal about the, dr the antiviral drug for HIV that was priced at like 700 bucks for a pill. And then the guy that created it is in jail, if I'm not wrong, so something like that, right? So there's a lot of, re of um, work being done on viruses. I use them a lot in the lab because they're very good ways of inserting your own DNA of interest inside other cells. So for example, if I want to express a gene, overexpress it to see what more of that gene does in the cell, then I will use it, I will use a virus, I'll put the DNA inside this little bubble here, and then I will put it with my cells and it will infect them and then insert that DNA in it, okay? Which is of interest to us because we're looking at inheritance of genes and uh, through transduction. So, Viruses can, uh, are not alive according to biological terminology. They can only replicate within the target host. So they kind of hijack all the machinery and use it to replicate. But by themselves, they cannot do that compared to human cells or bacteria, which can do it. They have almost no genes, usually like between four to a hundred. And those genes are just important for them to replicate and sometimes for the virulence of the virus. They are specific to the host, so not all viruses affect the same population of cells. Bacteriophage, for example, affects only bacteria, and then subcategories of bacteriophage have specific bacteria that they can infect. Um, HIV goes into your white blood cells. Influenza takes care of your um, lungs. Hepatitis, uh, mix of many, uh, many cells, herpes, skin, and then the secondary infection is in the brain. So if you see those cold sores that you get, that's coming from herpes simplex virus. There's two versions of it. One of them is related to uh, the upper body. The other one is the bottom body. Hopefully <laughs> no bottom body, okay? Because <laughs> it's quite uh, dangerous. But uh, the, upper, the upper body one, if you realize it comes back every time your kind of immune system goes down, usually at the beginning of the winter. So it's an opportunistic virus. As you can see, I love viruses, okay? <laughs> Um, what did I want to say? So yeah, so they have different targets. Uh, they have different targets. Um, and then bacteria and phage. So this is funny because it's the, like scientists like to call this the oldest war uh, between bacteria and phage because bacteria get infected by the phage and then they get destroyed by the phage. And I'll show you something interesting about this, how we can use phages to kill bacteria during an infection instead of antibiotics, okay? So we'll see that a bit later. Also, they are the source of molecular biology and, for example, CRISPR. So CRISPR is one of the craziest techniques ever invented. It uses the bacterial immune system to, as a basis for cutting DNA and then in certain specific genes that you want. Okay, You'll see this probably in molecular bio or something like that. I'm going to try to apply during the summer, because they're giving it this summer. We'll see. Um, but they don't want to say. So under an electron microscope or under a microscope, it looks like this. Okay, So they look like little robots here that come and affect the cells, and they insert the DNA just like that. Okay. One type of them is called the T4 phage, and it's the one that we're going to focus on. Uh, it has different parts, the head, which contains the DNA, the core, the sheet which covers it to protect it, and then these little fibers that act as legs and attach to specific bacteria. So these recognize specific proteins on the bacteria. If the bacteria does not have that, then this will not 
recognize that bacteria. Okay. For example, COVID is specific for the ACE2 receptor in the lungs. So if you don't have ACE2 receptor, then you end up not getting infected. And babies apparently have very little amounts of ACE2 receptor. Right? So that's why we saw very little amount of infections in the babies compared to old people. Okay. Not because their immune system is stronger or whatever. It's just because they don't have as much of that receptor compared to us. So phages, they have two different ways of transferring DNA. Well, only one way, but then it ended up into two different cycles, which I'll go through. The first one is called the lytic cycle. And what happens during the lytic cycle is that the bacteria puts DNA in the, in the uninfected cell, so it attaches to it. The process of attachment is called adsorption. Not absorption, but adsorption, okay? Uh, don't worry, I will not ask you on the exam what's uh, adsorption or absorption or <laughs> try to mix you up, okay? Um, and then it will put the DNA inside the bacterium and that bacterium, that DNA will, will be used by, the, by this bacterium to produce the proteins from that virus. So it will use its own, the bacterium's ribosomes, uh, energy, etc. And then it will make multiple copies of this virus, which will then package the DNA, its own DNA. So the virus, his goal is just to reproduce. And reproducing means that it will hijack the cell, use its machinery to produce its protein, package its own DNA, and then just leave the bacterium. So this is what happens here. It will repackage into multiple viruses and then explode the cell because there's too much of it and be released in the media and go infect other uh, other cells. This is why when you have, for example, a cold sore, they say it's better not to touch it because if you touch it and the liquid found on there uh, touches your finger and then you transfer it, you will infect other people. Okay, makes sense? So this is what happens and you see these bubbles forming Sorry to be kind of nasty, but biology, you know, <laughs> these bubbles that form are basically just these cells exploding in there, okay? And then forming this kind of, between the two layers of skin and forming this kind of media full of viruses. So it's very infectious, okay? So this is called the lytic cycle. What happens is that when it does this process, it will also degrade the chromosome of the, the bacterium. And then sometimes by accident, it will pick up the DNA from that host. And this is how you, in, you can use transduction to transfer DNA from one bacterium to the other because it will pick up by accident parts of the DNA of that host bacterium. And then when it explodes, go infect another bacterium and then give it, give it a gene or two from the host. We can study phages and their way of infecting cells by using the same method as bacteria. We use these plates but instead of having colonies forming, you have plaques forming. And these plaques, the way they are shaped and their size is different between each bacterial phage because some of them, for example, if they are slow, their lytic cycle is slow, they will form smaller colonies, smaller plaques, sorry, compared to the ones that have a faster lytic cycle because they will be exploding more bacteria super fast, okay? And then they have different shapes, et cetera. So plaque morphology usually is a good indicator of what kind of virus you're dealing with in terms of bacteria, right? In human cells, it's a different story. And uh, why is it transparent like this? It's because it starts as a colony, but then when it infects those bacteria, it explodes all of them. So they release their, um, their cytoplasm there and it forms these transparent kind of um, areas. Make sense? Questions? Yeah, the black, the, that's the plaques. It means that either the, there's an area that's clear or there's a plaque, which is the virus thing. Does that make sense? I'll uh, remove this for next semester. Just know that. Uh, no, 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 no. Okay, I will, I will uh, fix this, but um, yeah, so the clear area means there's nothing. The plaque means that there were bacteria there before, but because there's an infection with the virus, they all exploded and they're forming this like dark spots. Right, so this is what I just explained related to how transduction happens and how inheritance of genes can go from one bacteria to the other through a virus. It's through this faulty mechanism 
where by accident, the virus picks up DNA from the host instead of its own DNA. Yeah. Well, that, I'm getting there because there's two different cycles. Yeah, there's one of them where it doesn't die and the other where it dies. So I'll uh, get to that. But before that, so let's say, so what happens is that when it picks up by accident DNA from the host, then it will become, it will be carrying genetic material from the donor to the recipient. As you can see here, this donor bacterium has two genes, let's say, for example, A and B. And then when this whole process of uh, hijacking the machinery and producing the proteins and packaging the DNA happens, it can take up either B or A, the segments there. And so you have viruses that are carrying A, viruses that are carrying B, and then let's say, for example, you this vi virus that contains the gene A infects another bacterium, then you have that DNA that enters and sometimes recombination happens, leading to a change in genotype. Yeah, um, uh, he just asked this, so I will uh, I will explain uh, I will explain that in a sec. Okay. Yeah, maybe I should move it before. So this this process here is it clear? Simple, right? And then we can obviously use this to do the same thing that we've done for all the inheritance stuff, mapping the DNA and finding the distance between genes. We'll get to that. This process here is called generalized transduction because it can pick up DNA from anywhere of this uh, donor bacterium. There's another type which is called specialized, which has a specific site where it happens, and I'll show you that in a minute. So I think I just went through that without, you know, going through the little stepped art here. But anyways, so as I said, phase transduction is a useful technique to kind of transfer genes between different bacterial strains. This is what I just sh showed. Um, and that, yeah, so it's a very rare process in the sense that it will pick up DNA from the host very rarely. Usually it's very good at recognizing its own DNA. So in the lab, what we do, for example, if we want it to pick up our own DNA, there is certain regions of the plasmid that have a sequence that it is recognized by this head here. And so we integrate it inside the plasmid and then it thinks that that is its own DNA because there's that region of DNA on the plasma. And so it picks up that instead of its own DNA, okay? Actually, we even remove its, its DNA from the, the, the story so that it only picks up our plasma. If, there was, if that sequence was not there, it would not be able to pick up the plasma, right? Um, that's why it's very rare in terms of naturally occurring, but if you do it for a plasmid, you can improve the efficiency. Yep. By chance. Yeah, but we can force the chance because there's a, if we are studying it in the lab, we put the sequence that it would recognize technically, and then it thinks it's its own DNA. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The reason why it's integrating here, it's because what happens, so in this case here, as you can see, to answer like partially your questions, your two questions, when it pick up, picks up DNA that is unrelated to its own DNA, then it does not have the code to make those virulent proteins and explode the cell, okay? This is part of the answer. It's, it picked up DNA from the host, so when it goes to infect the other one, it's just transferring the host's, the donor's DNA, and it does not have these other genes that allow it to become virulent, okay? Make sense? Yeah, you can have that. Um, the thing is, viruses can take up up to six, seven thousand base pairs. Okay, the space is limited, so it, it does happen 
by accident, by chance, because nothing is just this or that, right? Even for the, so I don't want to mix you up, but even for the examples of independent assortment and all that, you know, the three to one is not really three to one. It's close to that, but not all the time. Even the recessive lethal, it's not always lethal, right? So nature is a bit more complex than just three to one and that, right? You could even have uh, phages that don't have any DNA or phages that, you know, uh, have three different sequences, right? But for the purpose of this course, you can do this or that, <laughs> okay? Um, yeah? Uh, it, it, no, no, so, okay. So this phage here, when it infects this cell, it's putting the DNA from the phage. So then this loner bacterium has ribosomes in it that will produce the proteins, which are the phages proteins. Yeah. Then they will be constructed inside the bacterium and they will... No, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't need its own DNA. So it starts, it needs its own DNA to be, to produce these proteins. Yeah. And so this, then these proteins will take up DNA at random, including the donor's DNA, and then form these viruses here. But those that contain the DNA from the host don't have the DNA for themselves, which does this whole process here. And so this is why they can uh, infect this cell without exploding. Okay. There's another ex explanation that I'll give you in a second because there's two different cycles, the lytic cycle, which explodes the cell, and then the temperate cycle, which allows the DNA to insert inside the bacterium's own DNA and not produce these proteins. Okay, we'll see that in a second. Let me just read to remember what I was writing here. Uh, was using. Yep. So the phage, phage can take up uh, can take up seven. 75 KB, so the bacteriophage, sorry, can take up about 75 KB of DNA. What I said about 7,000 to 8,000 KB is for the lentiviral system, the one I use, but apparently if the phage can take up more, forgot about that. And so the amount of DNA that it takes is about 1.5 minute of transfer, right? So remember the genes that go in one by one. Uh, when we talked about conjugation and all that, it's the same thing. It takes 1.5 minutes to go from one end to the other. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So what happens is that if you want to select your infected bacterium, uh, usually the plasmid that you're working with has some sort of antibiotic resistance. And so if you want the bacteria that were infected with your virus, you will put an antibiotic because when they take the DNA from the phage, they will become resistant to something, right? And, uh, and then you can use that as a selection marker. The other thing is the plaques shape. If the bacteria explode, right? You know that those bacterium don't have, uh, actually were infected by your virus while the other is not. So you can see that changing on the plaque. And then if you see the colonies, you know that they are not infected. Then you can pick up from there. And for sure, just that tiny amount, if you have one bacterium in it, that's sufficient to make millions. Make sense? That's the next slide. <laughs> so let me repeat that again, okay? <laughs> okay, so we can use this to map genes. Uh, because when bacteria affects, uh, uh, when virus infects the bacterium, it will transfer DNA. And usually you can use markers to select for those that were infected. So for example, if we infect uh, E. coli with P1, so that's just phage one, okay? It's a short way of writing phage and then its number. And then you can select for a certain marker, which will tell you if those bacterium were infected or not. And then to map the genes, Let's say, for example, you first selected for uh, leucine requirement, then you can, and then you take those colonies that were, uh, that needed leucine, for example, uh, or that have the leucine uh, producing gene, and then you would submit them to further downstream selection, for example, by putting them into azithromycin or threonine media. And what happens is that you will see that there's more cells that grow 
on azithromycin than on threonine. So that tells you that leucine and azi are close to each other. Is that clear? Because they were transferred together, and the closer they are, the more recombination, the more recombination happens, the more, um, the more genes are co-transduced, not recombina recombination, okay? Erase that word. And then you can do the same at the bottom two. So that's that. That's what I just said. Close to each other will be transduced more frequently. So leucine is closer to azithromycin and then further away from this threonine gene, right? And then you can use all these to map the whole uh, genome. So again, just to repeat, you take a bacterium that is that has everything, produce the phages in it, and use it to infect one that is sensitive to everything. And then depending on how many of them become resistant or start living, then you know which gene uh, is transduced with what. So this is the map. This is what I just said. Leucine is closer to azithromycin resistance and further from this THR or 3 in 1 uh, protein uh, gene, sorry. And then you do the same for the second one to find the full map. Any questions? Easy. Okay. Lysogenic cycle. So that's the second cycle that I told you about. And this is why uh, some viruses are much more dangerous than others. If you ever heard about STIs and their effect on the body, you heard that you can still have it, so don't get start freaking out, okay? <laughs> but you can still have it and it being dormant and then appearing like 10, 15 years later. That's because of this cycle here, right? So what happens is that when you get an inf when the bacterium gets infected by the bacterial phage, sometimes the DNA does not is not used by the bacterium to produce the phage's proteins, but instead integrates the bacterium's own DNA, and it becomes what we call dormant. So this is a different name for this is a temperate phage, right? So a lytic phage is a phage that explodes the cell, temperate is the one that has DNA integrated into the bacterium's own DNA. Yeah? Sorry? On cooked meat? Uh, this is part of it, yes, uh, because the reason why we cook stuff, really, is to get rid of all this stuff, uh, including these uh, viruses, which are found a lot on meat, yeah. Uh, is that, does that make sense? No, that's that's probably like some sort of you know. There's a lot of people that <laughs> uh, that uh, say random stuff about science. I don't know who told you this, but <laughs> uh, now you're the one who's supposed to tell them. No, this does not make sense. Okay, <laughs> but um, what happens is that uh, these viruses are, you know, they're, your body is pretty good as, at getting rid of them because if you get infected. Usually, it's able to recognize infected cells, usually. Um, some of them are more successful than others, like HIV, etc. And uh, it will attack your own cells and get rid of them. But HIV is a bit more complicated. Why? Because it's inside the white blood cells. So, you know, they can't really... <laughs> they're the ones uh, that are affected, okay? And so, what did I want to say? So, these two cycles are like this, okay? The infection still happens. But then there's two possibilities. Either you go and do the lytic cycle, like we just talked about, or you go dormant, and then at some point you reappear. This is the same thing with HSV, the uh, simplex virus, because it stays dormant the whole year and then suddenly comes and annoys you October, September, or somewhere around those dates. Okay? Turns into the lytic cycle. And same thing happens for the bacteria. They have the same thing. So this is another way where DNA can be transferred from one bacterium to the other by having this lytic cycle, uh, lysogenic cycle happen and then that DNA being integrated into the bacterium's own DNA. Yeah? Most of the time. Uh, some of them are, uh, most of the time is uh, it's random. Some of them are opportunistic. 
So they will still keep some protein in the cell and uh, leave it there. And then at some point when they feel like, oh, it's the good time, oh, it goes out, okay? <laughs> and then they wake up. Um, <clears throat> most of them are related to temperature, right? That's why you get sick uh, during certain periods of the year, not because you didn't wear your coat like your mom told you, okay? <laughs> you know, actually, I always used to always fight with my mom about this because she seemed to understand that if you remove your coat, you're going to get sick, okay? So I had to wear like the whole thing. Reality is it's not that because we are ectotherms, uh, endotherms, and your body regulates its own temperature, okay? If you lose one degree, you're going to be shaking like this, okay? <laughs> So, so your body is ready, is already prepared for maintaining the right temperature. What happens is that when you go in the cold without your coat, your mucous membranes start producing these fluids to keep you hydrated from not, you know, drying, okay, in your nose and all that. And that is a better media for infection, not because it's cold, okay? You see these people that jump inside like ice baths and all that and they never get sick. It's because they just jump in the ice bath and then they go inside and that's it right so it's not they don't have any exposure to that virus but or bacterium or whatever but it's not related to the temperature itself okay yep exactly exactly uh, it stays dormant and then at some point decides to pop out or start being transcribed by the machinery of the cell Random. No, no, it's, it, it's mostly random. It just, uh, out loops just like, uh, in conjugation, you know, it can just by itself loop out. Yep. Yep. Um, that's a very good question. So what happens is that there are a few. So when you get infected, usually, uh, let's say, for example, HIV, I think you have to wait after let's say a doubt or whatever, you have to wait like two weeks before going to do the test. Um, if you have a doubt, then you have no symptoms for let's say a few years, it's very complicated for you to know if you have the virus, right? But there are some DNA tests that recognize that sequence from your own cells and then um, tell you if you have that virus that is dormant or not, because they have specific DNA sequences that integrate into your own genome. And so when you take out the DNA from your cells, and then use some sort of polymerase chain reaction which copies the DNA, you will know if it's there or not and which type of virus is there. Cool? Yeah. Yeah, uh, family, you're gonna have to start screaming, man. <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, okay, so let me uh, tell you. So HIV, see, we're gonna turn this into a virology. I like this. <laughs> so what did I want to say? So when the mother has HIV, um, the baby gets the immune system from his mother, okay? So uh, the initial, initial immu immunity of the baby comes from the mother, from the blood exchange, okay? They don't take everything. Usually they take the antibodies, they don't take all the different cells. So there's a chance that the baby does not get the virus. But for the baby to get the virus, it needs to have, the, the mother needs to have the virus itself in her blood. That's why we use antiviral drugs to de decrease the amount of virus in the blood so that the baby does not have HIV, okay? Or, you know, transmission um, in any way, okay? The other thing with this, um, related to, 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 to HIV, there was a, there was a Chinese researcher, uh, forgot his name, but he did something that kind of okay with, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, it's necessary. Why is it necessary? Because if we follow these, uh, regulations and ethical stuff, we'll never advance in science. Okay. So there were these two parents that had HIV and had a baby. So the fetus was genetically engineered to remove the HIV from the baby. The, HIV, the baby survived without HIV, but that scientist, basically his career was, de was destroyed because now he's in jail for not following eth ethical regulation 
which were determined by whatever, and he lost his whole career. Does that make sense? But he saved the baby, right? So I'm okay with that side, but you know, shouldn't be saying this stuff, okay? <laughs> um, for sure, we're gonna have to do it one day, this genetic in, uh, editing and engineering, because um, it can save a lot of uh, a lot of people. It's just the problem with this is that it's dangerous because you cannot control where does this where does this genetic engineering and editing happen. Like you do, but people are still freaking out. Okay, in the lab we're very specific with it. You know where it's gonna cut, but on humans we're like, eh, maybe it's gonna cut somewhere else, and then we're gonna die. You know, so there's some ethical stuff here that we have to watch out for. Okay, like cystic fibrosis, you can save it just by this. Uh, sickle cell anemia, you can save it by this. Huntington disease, right? It's just the one editing. You remove the bad one, you put the good one, that's it. But, you know, we have a lot to go in terms of ethics. Cool. What else? Remember when we talked about complement, the complementation? So this is the same thing with uh, viruses. You can infect a, a bacteria with two phages and then map the DNA of that, uh, map the DNA based on if they become wild type or not. So let's say you take two bacterium that are, you know, wild type for, let's say this one here is wild type for the R gene and this one is wild type for the H gene. And then if they, if you see a wild type effect in the bacterium that you know that those mutations are on the same gene. If not, they're on different genes, okay? And the way you do this, so this H gene, if I remember correctly, is the specificity for infection of the bacterium. And so this one here is only is only specific to one type of bacterium, let's say E. coli 1. And this one here can infect E. coli 1 and 2, right? And so to find the recombinants or those that were infected by both viruses, what you do is first you take E. coli type 1, E. coli type 2, mix them together, put them on a plate, and then add the virus. And the plaques that become completely dark means they were infected by both viruses. The ones that stay a little bit white, it means that they were infected only with one, but not the other, because there's still some bacterium left inside that column, okay? And you can use this to map the whole genome because it tells you which one became recombinants and which ones became, did not become recombinants. Complementation for transduction. Now, specialized transduction. Specialized, tra specialized transduction is more specific. It happens only at a certain spot on the DNA. So, for example, if you take the lambda phage, which is a bacteriophage, so it's plasmid, its own DNA, it has an attachment site on the E. coli chromosome, and it only attaches there. So, there's a crossover that happens here, and then the integration into the E. coli chromosome. So the, there's your transfer of DNA. And then what happens is that randomly, there's an out looping again, and you will produce a different lambda phage, the lambda prime phage plasmid, okay? And in this case, you don't take any DNA. You take the DNA that's just very close to where you integrate, right? While the other one, the generalized transduction, you break the DNA from the host completely, and then you can take any part, right? This one here, you can only take nearby. So you can't take more than 75 KB this way or that way, okay? So that's specialized transduction. This process here is random. Sometimes you'll pick up, let's say for example, the galactose gene. Sometimes you'll take the biotin gene, etc. okay? Not bad, not bad. Uh, what is this? This is the summary for the three mechanisms, okay? We have conjugation, transduction, transformation. The easiest, I guess, is transformation. Just pick up from, you know, the media. Conjugation is when you have two bacterium. There's a pillus that forms and a transfer uh, between both. And then you can use the recombinations to map the distance between genes. In transduction and transformation, the genes that are further apart are transduced less frequently together. That makes sense logic and then obviously you cannot transform the full DNA uh, from the host because the phage can only carry a little bit of DNA okay so some interesting stuff 
And then I think there's two slides. That's it. Okay. So the antibiotics have been used for a long time. You probably know that penicillin was the first one to be found out. If you take microbiology course, so three, I forgot where it is, 370, 371, something like this, okay? You learn about all the different classes of uh, antibiotics, what they do, how they act on the cells, which cell, which bacteria they kill, and all that, which is kind of close to pharmacy course more than a biology course, okay? And then, uh, so penicillin was the first one to be found. And then from there, it just went on one after the other. And they're all being used to kill different types of bacteria. And then in combination, so a bitherapy is what we call this, or tritherapy or whatever, if the bacterium is a super bacterium that is unkillable kind of because it became resistant to everything. The problem with these antibiotics, as I told you three lectures ago, is that if you abuse them, you're putting a selective pressure on the bacteria. And because they divide fast and the random process of DNA mutations, they acquire resistance to those antibiotics. So then nothing works and then you kind of die, okay? So the solution for this, there is uh, it's being they're being used obviously in like agriculture and all that uh, to you know prevent parasites and all that. If you want to learn about parasites, there's the invertebrate class. Making some promotion for the classes, <laughs> um, and then uh, and so there's a there are therapies that are coming up that are quite interesting. We know for a long time that bacteriophage kills bacteria, so why not use bacteriophage to get rid of the infection instead of the, uh, what do you call it, instead of the antibiotics, all right? And this was used on a teenager that was sick with the mycobacterium abiscus, whatever. I hate these names. They're complicated to say. <laughs> um, and uh, that person was, that bacterium was kind of resistant to all the antibiotics, but they were able to save it because they used the bacteri a bacteriophage that was specific for that bacterium and it basically exploded all the bacteria. The other thing that these, these phages are good for is that when they infect you, if they go into the, so their goal is to produce more of itself, right? And so it's like if you were taking antibiotics nonstop, right? And so this is why it's actually interesting to do. It's also more specific than antibiotics because antibiotics like penicillin, they affect uh, gram negative, one of the two, I always forget. Um, and so anyone that has any, uh, any bacteria that has a cell wall will be affected by penicillin. Now in your body, you have the gut microbiome, right? So when you take antibiotics, you affect that too. And that's not good for yourself. While the phages, you can engineer them to target only one bacteria because of one specific protein it has on its surface. And so it's highly specific, more efficient because it, has uh, it, it produces its own self right the only issue is that this too has the selective pressure the bacteria can become resistant to it right which is good and not good it's it's not good because it becomes just like antibiotic resistance but um, what's good about it is that it's highly specific so you can target only one thing and that thing and nothing else and uh yeah, there's a whole collection of phages that are being used right now. This is still uh, a therapy that is being tested in the lab or on people, like very isolated cases. And hopefully it's going to be something that can be used instead of antibiotics. Look at these undergraduate students that are making collections of 10,000 species. Of This is more than like my whole 10 years of research. Okay. <laughs> there are different levels of this stuff, you know. But uh, yeah, there's some uh, prodigy students here doing some. Interesting stuff. Cool. Questions? See you in a month, uh, two weeks. <laughs>